Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 23 The hot weather of July had crept upon them unawares, and the atmosphere of the flat vale hung heavy as an opiate over the dairy folk, the cows, and the trees. Hot, steaming rains fell frequently, making the grass where the cows fed yet more rank, and hindering the late haymaking in the other meads. It was Sunday morning. The milking was done. The outdoor milkers had gone home. Tess and the other three were dressing themselves rapidly, the whole bevy having agreed to go together to Melstock Church, which lay some three or four miles distant from the dairy house. She had now been two or three months at Talbothays, and this was her first excursion. All the preceding afternoon and night heavy thunderstorms had hissed down upon the meads and washed some of the hay into the river but this morning the sun shone out all the more brilliantly for the deluge, and the air was balmy and clear. The crooked lane leading from their own parish to Melstock ran along the lowest levels in a portion of its length, and when the girls reached the most depressed spot they found that the result of the rain had been to flood the lane over shoe to a distance of some fifty yards. This would have been no serious hindrance on a weekday, they would have clicked through it in their high pattens and boots quite unconcerned. But on this day of vanity, this sun's day, when flesh went forward to coquette with flesh, while hypocritically affecting business with spiritual things, on this occasion, for wearing their white stockings and thin shoes, and their pink, white, and lilac gowns, on which every mud spot would be visible, the pool was an awkward impediment. They could hear the church bell calling, as yet nearly a mile off. "'Who would have expected such a rise in the river in summer time? said Marian from the top of the roadside bank on which they had climbed, and were maintaining a precarious footing in the hope of creeping along its slope till they were past the pool. "'We can't get there anyhow without walking right through it, or else going round the turnpike way, and that would make us very late.' said Retty, pausing hopelessly. "'And I do colour up so hot walking into church late and all the people staring round,' said Marian, "'that I hardly cool down again till we get into the that it may please these.' While they stood clinging to the bank they heard a splashing round the bend of the road, and presently appeared Angel Clare advancing along the lane toward them through the water. Four hearts gave a big throb simultaneously. His aspect was probably as unsabbatarian a one as a dogmatic parson's son often presented, his attire being his dairy clothes, his long wading boots, a cabbage leaf inside his hat to cool his head down with a thistle spud to finish him off. "'He's not going to church,' said Marian. "'No, I wish he was,' murmured Tess. Angel, in fact, rightly or wrongly, to adopt the safe phrase of evasive controversialists, preferred sermons in stones to sermons in churches and chapels on fine summer days. This morning, however, he had gone out to see if the damage to the hay by the flood was considerable or not. On his walk he observed the girls from a long distance, though they had been so occupied with their difficulties of passage as not to notice him. He knew that the water had risen at that spot, and that it would soon quite check their progress. So he had hastened on, with a dim idea of how he could help, uh, one of them in particular. The rosy-cheeked, bright-eyed quartet looked so charming in their light summer attire, clinging to the roadside bank like pigeons on a roof-slope, that he stopped a moment to regard them before coming close. Their gauzy skirts had brushed up from the grass innumerable flies and butterflies, which, unable to escape, remained caged in the transparent tissue as in an aviary. Angel's eyes at last fell upon Tess, the hindmost of the four. She, being full of suppressed laughter at their dilemma, could not help meeting his glance radiantly. He came beneath them in the water, which did not rise over his long boots 
stopped and stood looking at the entrapped flies and butterflies. "'Are you trying to get to church?' he said to Marian, who was in front, including the next two in his remark, but avoiding Tess. "'Yes, sir, and it's getting late, and my colour do come up so. I'll carry you through the pool, every jill of you.' The whole four flushed as if one heart beat through them. "'I think you can't, sir,' said Marian. "'It's the only way for you to get past. Stand still. Nonsense! You're not too heavy. I'll carry you all four together. Now, Marian, attend,' he continued, "'and put your arms round my shoulders. So, now, hold on. That's well done.' Marian had lowered herself upon his arm and shoulder as directed and Angel strode off with her, his slim figure, as viewed from behind, looking like the mere stem to a great nosegay suggested by hers. They disappeared round the curve of the road, and only his sousing footsteps and the top ribbon of Marion's bonnet told where they were. In a few minutes he reappeared. Is Hewitt was the next in order upon the bank. "'Here he comes,' she murmured, and they could hear that her lips were dry with emotion and I have to put my arms round his neck and look into his face as Marion did." "'There's nothing in that,' said Tess quickly. "'There is a time for everything,' continued Iz, unheeding, a, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. The first is now going to be mine." "'Fie! It is Scripture, Iz.' "'Yes,' said Iz. I always a ear at church for pretty verses." Angel Clare, to whom three-quarters of this performance was a commonplace act of kindness, now approached Iz. She quietly and dreamily lowered herself into his arms, and Angel methodically marched off with her. When he was heard returning for the third time, Retty's throbbing heart could be almost seen to shake her. He went up to the red-haired girl and while he was seizing her he glanced at Tess. His lips could not have pronounced more plainly, "'It will soon be you and I.' Her comprehension appeared in her face. She could not help it. There was an understanding between them. Poor little Retty, though by far the lightest weight, was the most troublesome of Clare's burdens. Marian had been like a sack of meal, a dead weight of plumpness, under which he had literally staggered. Iz had ridden sensibly and calmly. Retty was a bunch of hysterics. However, he got through with the disquieted creature, deposited her, and returned. Tess could see over the hedge the distant three in a group, standing as he had placed them on the next rising ground. It was now her turn. She was embarrassed to discover that excitement at the proximity of Mr. Clare's breath and eyes, which she had contemned in her companions, was intensified in herself, and as if fearful of betraying her secret, she paltered with him at the last moment. "'I may be able to climb along the bank, perhaps. I can climb better than they. You must be so tired, Mr. Clare.' "'No, no, Tess,' said he quickly and almost before she was aware she was seated in his arms and resting against his shoulder. Three layers to one Rachel,' he whispered. "'They are better women than I,' she replied, magnanimously sticking to her resolve. "'Not to me,' said Angel. He saw her grow warm at this, and they went some steps in silence. "'I hope I am not too heavy,' she said timidly. "'Oh, no!' You should lift Marian, such a lump! You are like an undulating billow warmed by the sun, and all this fluff of muslin about you is the froth. It is very pretty, if I seem like that to you. Do you know that I have undergone three-quarters of this labour entirely for the sake of the fourth quarter? No. I did not expect such an event to-day. Nor I. The water came up so sudden." That the rise in the water was what she understood him to refer to, the state of her breathing belied. Clare stood still, and inclined his face toward hers. "'Oh, Tessie!' he exclaimed. 
The girl's cheeks burned to the breeze, and she could not look into his eyes for her emotion. It reminded Angel that he was somewhat unfairly taking advantage of an accidental position, and he went no further with it. No definite words of love had crossed their lips as yet, and suspension at this point was desirable now. However, he walked slowly to make the remainder of the distance as long as possible. But at last they came to the bend, and the rest of their progress was in full view of the other three. The dry land was reached, and he set her down. Her friends were looking with round, thoughtful eyes at her and him, and she could see that they had been talking of her. He hastily bade them farewell, and splashed back along the stretch of submerged road. The four moved on together as before, till Marian broke the silence by saying, "'No, in all truth we have no chance against her.' She looked joylessly at Tess. "'What do you mean?' asked the latter. "'He likes he best, the very best. We could see it as he brought he. He would have kissed thee if you had encouraged him to do it ever so little.' "'No, no,' said she. The gaiety with which they had set out had somehow vanished, and yet there was no enmity or malice between them. They were generous young souls. They had been reared in the lonely country nooks where fatalism is a strong sentiment, and they did not blame her. Such supplanting was to be. Tess's heart ached. There was no concealing from herself the fact that she loved Angel Clare perhaps all the more passionately from knowing that the others had also lost their hearts to him. There is contagion in this sentiment, especially among women, and yet that same hungry heart of hers compassionated her friends. Tess's honest nature had fought against this, but too feebly, and the natural result had followed. "'I will never stand in your way, nor in the way of either of you she declared to Retty that night in the bedroom, her tears running down. "'I can't help this, my dear. I don't think marrying is in his mind at all. But if he were even to ask me, I should refuse, as I should refuse any man.' "'Oh, would you? Why?' said wondering Retty. "'It cannot be. But I will be plain, putting myself quite on the other side. I don't think he will choose either of you." "'I have never expected it, thought of it,' moaned Retty. "'But, oh, I wish I were dead!' The poor child, torn by a feeling which she hardly understood, turned to the two other girls who came upstairs just then. "'We be friends with her again,' she said to them. "'She thinks no more of his choosing her than we do.' So the reserve went off, and they were confiding and warm. "'I don't seem to care what I do now,' said Marian, whose mood was turned to its lowest base. "'I was going to marry a dairyman at Stickleford, who asked me twice. But my soul I would put an end to myself rather than be his wife now. Why don't ye speak, Iz?' "'To confess, then,' murmured Iz, "'I made sure to-day that he was going to kiss me as he held me and I lay still against his breast, hoping and hoping, and never moved at all. But he did not. I don't like biding here at Talbothoy's any longer. I shall go home." The air of the sleeping chamber seemed to palpitate with the hopeless passion of the girls. They writhed feverishly under the oppressiveness of an emotion thrust on them by cruel nature's law, an emotion which they had neither expected nor desired. The incident of the day had fanned the flame that was burning the inside of their hearts out, and the torture was almost more than they could endure. The differences which distinguished them as individuals were abstracted by this passion, and each was just a portion of one organism called sex. There was so much frankness and so little jealousy, because there was no hope. Each one was a girl of fair common sense, and she did not delude herself with any vain conceits, or deny her love, or give herself airs, in the idea of outshining the others. 
the full recognition of the futility of their infatuation from a social point of view, its purposeless beginning, its self-bounded outlook, its lack of everything to justify its existence in the eye of civilization, while lacking nothing in the eye of nature. The one fact that did exist, ecstaticizing them to a killing joy, all this imparted to them a resignation, a dignity, which a practical and sordid expectation of winning him as a husband would have destroyed. They tossed and turned on their little beds, and the cheese-ring dripped monotonously downstairs. "'Be you awake, Tess?' whispered one half an hour later. It was Is Hewitt's voice. Tess replied in the affirmative whereupon also Retty and Marian suddenly flung the bedclothes off them and sighed. "'So be we. I wonder what she be like, the lady they say his family have looked out for him.' "'I wonder,' said Iz. "'Some lady looked out for him?' gasped Tess, starting. "'I have never heard of that.' "'Oh, yes, tis whispered. A young lady of his own rank chosen by his family, a doctor of divinity's daughter, near his father's parish of Eminster. He don't much care for her, they say, but he is sure to marry her." They had heard so very little of this, yet it was enough to build up wretched doldrum dreams upon, there in the shade of the night. They pictured all the details of his being won round to consent of the wedding preparations, of the bride's happiness, of her dress and veil, of her blissful home with him, then oblivion would have fallen upon themselves as far as he and their love were concerned. Thus they talked and ached and wept till sleep charmed their sorrow away. After this disclosure Tess nourished no further foolish thought that there even lurked any grave and deliberate import in Clare's attentions to her. It was a passing summer love of her face for love's own temporary sake, nothing more. And the thorny crown of this sad conception was that she whom he really did prefer in a cursory way to the rest she who knew herself to be more impassioned in nature, cleverer, more beautiful than they, was in the eyes of propriety far less worthy of him than the homelier ones whom he ignored. End of chapter 23